Welcome back class, Dr. Lindner. We are on our last subject um, for connective tissue, um, which is blood. Uh, we are talking about liquid or fluid connective tissue. Now, when we look at blood, blood has the temperature of about 100 to 100.5 degrees. The pH of blood is somewhere between 7.35 and 7.45. So we know that that averages out to about 7.4 pH, which is slightly alkalinic, just a little bit. The volume of blood for males is about five to six liters of blood, and the volume for females is about four to five liters of blood. Think of what happens if someone eats too much salt in their diet, then allows that person to retain and hold on to more water. So the volume and the blood volume starts to increase. When you increase blood volume, you can increase blood pressure. And this is why many people use diuretics to get rid of the excess water to decrease the blood volume, to decrease the blood pressure. In emergency crisis situations, I think that that's okay. I think it makes sense. But remember, whenever you lose water, what follows water are minerals. And the problem with diuretics is when you lose water, you lose minerals. The minerals that is dangerous to lose is potassium. And when you lose potassium, magnesium follows. When you lose potassium and then you lose magnesium and you lose these important minerals that are needed for electrolytes, then the heart doesn't quite function the way it's supposed to. And there are some people that use these chronically that just their heart just stops beating on the spot. It's called ventricular ectopy. It happens to be one of the adverse reactions to some diuretics. So you have to be careful of this. When someone's blood is taken and their blood is spun, you know, it's put in through a centrifuge and it spins it, it's in the test tube and it spins, um, what's in there separates. It separates so that we have formed elements and unformed elements. The formed elements are the blood cells, where we have red blood cells, which are erythrocytes, and white blood cells that are called leukocytes. And 45%, 45% of that type of tissue is cells. The other 55%, is matrix, it's extracellular matrix, right? What is it called when you have a bunch of cells scattered throughout with lots of matrix? That's connective tissue. So 55% of the total blood volume is plasma, which is the matrix. And that matrix is made up of 91.5% water, 7% proteins, and 1.5% solutes. The red blood cells are interesting. They really shouldn't be called a cell because cells have nuclei, right? Cells do carry a nucleus, but red blood cells do not have a nucleus. Red blood cells, if they had a nucleus, a nucleus is a large organelle. If a red blood cell had a nucleus, then there wouldn't be any room within it to carry the oxygen, right? So red blood cells aren't using the oxygen that it carries to make ATP. It just delivers that oxygen to the lungs. And when that red blood cell gets into the lungs, the lung has a pH that's slightly alkalinic or basic, okay? So when this red blood cell goes to the lungs where we have oxygen, this red blood cell scoops up the oxygen there because you got hemoglobin in there. And the iron 
hooks up to oxygen. And the hemoglobin is going to carry the oxygen. And it's going to bring it to the cellular level, to other tissues and cells that have mitochondria that need that oxygen. But at the level of the cell, remember, you've got the mitochondria, you've got the Krebs cycle, which is called the citric acid cycle. So at the cell level, it's much more acidic, and the hemoglobin releases the oxygen. At the lung level, it's more basic and alkalinic, so it sticks, the red blood cell sticks to the oxygen. At the level of the cell, it dumps the oxygen so that the mitochondria can use it in order to make ATP. But new, the red blood cells don't have a nucleus, okay? When we look at blood, this is a blood smear. So this is the plasma. That's the ECM, the extracellular matrix. These are red blood cells. They're biconcave discs. So from the lateral view, it would look like this, right? Biconcave, that's concave and that's concave. It's pretty thin in the center. And that's why in the center of these, it's hypochromic. Right, it looks like a donut, very thin in the center, because the light passes through the center of the microscope, passes through the center of that red blood cell from the microscope much, much easier because it's thinner here and it's thicker in the periphery. So it's much thicker in the periphery of the red blood cell, lighter on the inside, hypochromic. So these are RBCs or erythrocytes, and um, the matrix remember is the plasma the cells are either erythrocytes or leukocytes and even these small little fragments that are called platelets platelets help us clot right the red blood cells are going to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide and nitric oxide and the white blood cells help to defend us defending us meaning they have immune function the platelets are involved with clotting and the red blood cell carries oxygen, it carries CO2 and even nitric oxide, which dilates our blood vessels. When we look at the white blood cells, white blood cells are divided into granular and agranular. granular and agranular. The granular applies to the granulations that you see in the cytoplasm. In all of these, in the eosinophils, neutrophils, and basophils, you can see they each have a nucleus and around in the cytoplasm, it's very grainy, it's very granular. But the agranular sites, the cytoplasm looks kind of clear. It doesn't look as grainy as these. So the granular sites are ben, basophil, eosinophil, and neutrophil. Basophil, eosinophil, and neutrophil. The phil, like the word philos, like hydrophilic, philic means friend of. Uh, if you are a philosophy, right, if you look at the word philo, Sophie, philo means friend or love of, and Sophie means wisdom, the love of wisdom or to like wisdom. Phil, philo means to like. So an eosinophil likes an acidic stain and takes it up as red. A basophil likes a basic type of stain and stains it blue. And neutra, neutrophil is neutral. It's neutral. The eosinophil has a nucleus that's typically bilobed. It's usually one, two lobes. A neutrophil can have three to five lobes to the nucleus. So this is like one, two, that looks like three lobes to the nucleus. And a basophil is obscured. It's very hard to see the nucleus in a basophil because it's obscured by the dark staining granules, okay? So um, eosinophils are high 
if there's a parasite infection or if a person has allergies, you're gonna see high amount of eosinophils. Neutrophil count is high when there's a bacterial infection. Okay, so neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, basophils also seen with allergies, uh, they produce histamine. They produce histamine. Your eosinophil makes histamine ACE. <laughs> so what this is making, this is trying to mediate it and try and hold, hold down the histamine so you don't have a big histamine reaction. Lymphocytes and monocytes, these are agranular. Monocytes we know are always in circulation and they evolve and become macrophages. Macrophages are phagocytes. So monocytes, they're pretty large cells. They have their, their agranular, has this kidney bean-shaped nucleus, and they become macrophages. Lymphocytes, these are typically seen with viral infections. So if you're having a viral infection, your lymphocytes go up. If you're having a bacterial infection, your neutrophils go up. So a little easy way to remember that is never bet Las Vegas. Never bet Las Vegas. Neutrophils, lymphocytes. Never bet Las Vegas. Neutrophils are high with a bacterial infection. Lymphocytes are high with a viral infection. And these are the platelets, and these are involved with clotting. Um, you can down-regulate the amount of platelets. Some people like to use aspirin. A little bit dangerous to use aspirin. Even baby aspirin is very controversial these days. Old school, a lot of people take baby aspirin to try and thin the blood. There are many, many safe, effective ways of trying to thin the blood, um, even with nutrition and by natural means. Um, I like using for myself, I use NATO, Cerezymes. Uh, this became pretty prominent, and very popular uh, after COVID because of the clotting proteins. Uh, so the NATO Cerezymes like to thin the blood naturally. Um, the liver can recognize it. It's not toxic. Uh, people use niacin to thin the blood. People use omega-3s to thin the blood. Uh, people use vitamin E to thin the blood. People use garlic to thin the blood. People use red wine or resveratrol in red wine. All of these things are really good at keeping the blood uh, nice and thin. Also, what increases circulation is exercise because just by exercise and by contracting muscles, it acts as a pump. Uh, breathing, diaphragmatic contraction, movement of the diaphragm helps to pump all fluid in the blood. Massage therapy helps to increase circulation. B vitamins because of niacin, which is B3. Uh, people know that because sometimes they use niacin and they turn red or they turn, they turn, uh, they get flushed. So they make a non-flushing form of niacin called niacinamide, omega-3 fish oils. That's why if you've ever had to go on for surgery, they'll always tell you, stop your supplements. If you're on fish oils, stop them. If you're on B vitamins, stop them because they don't want you on any blood thinners because during, after surgery, they need you to heal. So several days prior to any surgical procedure, they have you stop uh, the blood thinners and red wine also and garlic. It's the resveratrol in red wine that acts as the, as the, the thinner. Okay.